When I moved house in 2021, the garden had an ideal spot for my new observatory. Well, almost, apart from more than a dozen trees. We felled the trees and sold the greenhouse fairly quickly, but other jobs around the house delayed work on the observatory until spring 2022. By the time spring came around, the area was quite overgrown, though not as bad as the summer of 2021, where there were five feet tall thistles. The first job was to clear away the plant life, which began on the 9th of April. Fortunately the area was covered with a weed membrane, so the roots only extended two to three inches into the ground. By the 17th of April, I cleared enough space to start marking out the observatory footings. This in turn allowed me to plot the two pier positions. I moved the whole footprint by about 8 inches, so that the piers would clear two tree stumps. Once the location was finalized, I marked out and started digging out the first eight footings. With those dug out and the bottom of the holes filled with some hardcore, I plotted out the last two footings and dug those out. On the 22nd, two 12-inch diameter cardboard postal tubes arrived in the post. These were the formers for the concrete piers. I discovered that high-density concrete blocks were cheaper than bags of concrete for the same volume. As a result, I laid two blocks on a thin bed of concrete in the bottom of the hole and then filled the gap around the outside. This gave me an indication of how much concrete I'd need for each footing, so I could place an order for delivery. On the 23rd, I got the next three footings concreted in. Over the next few days, further supplies arrived, including the timber for the floor joists, a pallet of concrete blocks and a pallet of ready mixed concrete. On the 27th of April, another delivery arrived. This time it was the 12 by 8 feet, pent roof shed, that would be converted into the observatory. There were around 350 kilograms of shed parts that needed moving from the drive to the workshop. The easiest way was to unscrew a few parts from the pallet, load them onto the car, and drive them around the back of the house for unloading. It took quite some time to move everything first to the patio, and then stacked up in the workshop. With the new deliveries of concrete, I was able to get the other six footings concreted in place. I also made a start on digging out the foundation for the first pier. On the 29th, I started cutting the floor joists and supports. I needed to establish the floor height as that also dictated the foundation height for the piers. The four main outer joists were cut to size, but were only clamped together, as at this point, they would need to be removed again for access to the pier foundations. At the end of the day, two floor panels were brought out to measure the floor position. On the 3rd of May, I took the floor height measurements and started planning out the roll-off roof angle on the shed end panels. This was to bring the scope near the top edge of the wall, so the wall would provide some wind protection, while still allowing it to view over the edge and clear the roof height. It took some time to be sure everything would work out right, but three days later, I started cutting wood. A two-inch square rail would tie the two end panels together and give a mounting surface for the roof runner. A couple of days later, I was back out cutting the additional floor joist legs. The corner leg mounts had been drilled for the concrete fixing so they could be repositioned accurately each time. The first end panel was brought out to check heights once again and to get a feel for the size of the observatory. On the 9th of May, I continued with the digging of the Pier 1 foundation. The hole was around 0.7 meters cubed in size. I planned on building three layers of concrete blocks inside the hole, which would then be filled with concrete. The first step was a thin level concrete foundation, at the bottom of the hole, with four rebars in the center. On the 10th, I started painting the floor joists in their first coat of bitumen. While the bitumen was drying, I started digging Pier 2. Although only a short distance from the first, it was full of rocks, bricks and concrete, the remains of a World War II air raid shelter. Here's the pile of rubble that came out of the hole. You can see a brick in the top of the pile to give scale to it all. By chance, the edge of the hole fell in line with a buried air raid shelter wall. Thankfully, it wasn't in the way of the pier. By the end of the day, the second pier foundation hole was complete. The foundation base and rebar for the second pier were laid, but with rain forecast, the hole was covered. On the 12th of May, I started laying the concrete blocks for Pier 1. It wasn't easy laying them at the bottom of a deep hole with the rebar sticking up. The three layers of concrete blocks are complete and were left to set. While Pier 1 was setting, I started laying blocks in Pier 2. 
On the 13th, I was preparing for filling the piers with concrete. These wooden frames were to hold the rebar straight in the foundation and in the pier tubes. The floor joists were refitted the following day, to check the pier foundation height against the floor height. The first pier was a couple of inches low, so an additional layer of bricks was added to the top. The pier tubes were brought out to do further measuring and checking. With both pier tubes balanced in place over the foundations, the end panel was brought back out to once again check the height. So many things were all interrelated, so I was constantly checking. On the 17th of May, I started mixing concrete and filling the first pier foundation. The wooden frame held the original rebar vertically and also the second layer of four rebars. The next day, the first pier tube was fitted and supported with guy lines. The bottom joint was filled with clay to stop the concrete leaking out. With everything checked to be vertical, I started pouring concrete into the tube. Including the foundation, there's probably five to six hundred kilograms of concrete in each pier. After lunch, the foundation of pier two was poured. On the 19th, the second pier tube was fitted, and that was filled with concrete. The gap between the pier foundation blocks and the earth hole was half filled with concrete. It was all fairly solid and heavy enough, so to save money, the remains of the hole was filled with a clay slurry, packed down and left to set. The first pier was covered with a rubble sack to keep any rain off, and since the second still had the guy lines to support it while setting, that was covered with a spare roof tile. A couple of days later, I drilled the mounting holes for the remaining floor joist legs, into their concrete pads. A weed membrane was then measured, and cut to allow it to drop over the piers. It was taped around the bottom of the piers and spread out over the observatory footprint. The joist legs were then bolted down for the last time. With those joists in place, I could now measure and cut the intermediate joists at the one-third and two-thirds positions. Soap on the long screws helped to minimize friction as they were screwed into the joists. By the end of the 21st, the two intermediate joists were fitted, and painted in bitumen. A couple of days later, I bought a load of timber to clad the plinth of the observatory. These would be painted in bitumen on the inside, and shed paint on the outside. On the 24th, I was back to cutting floor joists. These were shorter sections to link the main and intermediate joists. By the end of the day, all of these were fitted and painted. On the 25th, the final short timbers were added to the floor joists. They were all painted in bitumen and left to dry. These were all needed to support the shed floor parts. On the 28th of May, I began the plinth cladding. This extended all the way to the garden shed concrete base. By the second last day of May, the plinth was completed. With that done, I was finally moving upwards, away from the ground. Late in the day, the floor panels were carried out and placed on the joists. This would allow me to mark out the pier positions, so that the floor could be cut to clear them. Back to the workshop and the floor cutting began. One pier fell entirely in one floor panel. This was a good fit over the pier and on the joists. I also cut three inspection holes in the floor, to allow weed killer to be sprayed under the observatory if needed. The other pier hole cut into four floor panels. All six panels were brought back out for a fit check around the piers. The floor planks were reinforced around the holes to make sure they are fully supported. All the floor panels were given two coats of varnish to protect them. The underside of the floor panels were given two coats of bitumen. With the floor done, on the 7th of June, I started work on the front wall. This was assembled from three shed panels, all of which had to be cut down in height. The next day, I started painting the observatory end panels. The panels were factory made with a nail gun, and all the nail holes showed up really clearly against the light green paint. As a result, all the holes were filled. One end and the front wall, are both seen here, filled and painted. By June the 10th, the concrete piers were hard enough for more checking. The first telescope mount and pier adapter were placed on pier 2 for a height check in relation to the end wall. Without the floor fitted, the wall was sitting two inches low, but allowing for that, the pier and mount height were all looking good. With the paint on the front wall dry, I was able to resize the door and get that temporarily fitted so the hardware could be drilled. The next step, was to start modifying the tops of the end panels, the parts that would form part of the rolling roof. The two panels that make up each end would be tied together with another two-inch square timber. This would become the mount for the roof wheels.
The roof end panel had a double taper, being around 16 inches tall at the front and 12 inches at the back. Here's how it looks sitting on top of the end wall. On the 16th of June, the roof panels were laid out on the patio and given a coat of bitumen. A few days later on the 22nd, I was assembling the three-piece rear wall of the observatory. Once assembled and the nail holes filled, that too was painted. That took me into July. On the 2nd of July, it was time to install the observatory floor. It turned out that not all of the factory-built floor panels were square. This caused a few problems, but eventually I got them all installed. Back to the roof panels a couple of days later, this is the rear wall of the roof. The rear and sides would be fixed pieces, while the front roof wall would have an opening panel. The insides of all the panels were painted with shed paint to help protect the walls from damp on cold nights with the roof open. They all had two coats of paint by the 7th of July. On the 11th of July, the weather was good and my wife was free to help, so it was time to start building walls. First was an end and rear wall. The other end was attached next. The panels were screwed to each other, but not immediately to the floor. I needed to double check everything was square before screwing the panels to the floor. The front is now screwed in place. By the end of the day, all four walls were in place, attached to the floor, and the door was fitted. Back in the workshop, I started fitting wheels to the roof end panels. With all the wheels fitted, the end was trial fitted on the wall. There wasn't enough material in the original wall to cut it so that the planking would align. Smaller wheels were attached to guide the roof on the L-shaped roof runners. Both roof end panels have all their wheels fitted now. The observatory isn't aligned with the cardinal points, so there was lots of measuring of angles to establish north in relation to the pier. This allowed the concrete pier to be drilled for the first mount adapter. The following day, the Explorer 200 PDS telescope was mounted on Pier 1 to check its height for roof clearance. I then checked the view that the scope had. This is looking north. The top of the tree is 16 degrees above the horizon. This is the northeast view. The peak of the garage roof is 15 degrees altitude. The gap between the trees is east-southeast, and is 10 degrees altitude, while the treetops are 19. Around the south it is about 5 degrees, and in the southwest, about 2 degrees before the conifer. The view west is around 6 degrees above the horizon. By the 21st of July, I'd also had two steel discs delivered. These were drilled and painted for the second pier adapter. A resin block was turned on the lathe for the interface between the scope mount and steel disc. Here it is for a test fit on the mount. The new adapter on the left, awaiting paint, and the original on the right. On the 23rd of July, I began work on the roof runner supports. The timber was clamped in place to plot the position of the support foundations. A single concrete block was embedded in concrete for the runner footings. There was one each side and one in the center for diagonal bracing. Once the concrete was set, I was able to mount the upright support. Then I started jigging up the runner to follow the observatory roof line. I made a wooden guide, which could slide up and down the runners to ensure they remained parallel. I took some time checking the angles were parallel too. Once I was completely happy with the alignment, the runner supports were painted and then screwed in place. Diagonal braces were added against the rear wall of the observatory. At the lowest end, two additional diagonal braces were added, bolted to a concrete footing in the center. On top of the wooden support, I screwed a 2-inch L section of aluminium for the actual roof runner. One roof end panel was brought out, to check the runner, and the height of the roof when open. On the 27th of July, the four roof walls were brought out to be assembled. As with the main walls, one end and the rear wall were clamped together first. The other end wall, and the top of the front wall were next. The gap would have an opening flap fitted, to allow the roof to clear the telescopes when the roof was opened. After lots more measuring, the roof panels were screwed together. Here's a front view, showing the opening for scope clearance. Once it was all screwed firmly together, I released the clamps that held the roof in the closed position, and slowly rolled the roof open to check how freely it ran on the runners. Thankfully, all my careful measuring meant there was no binding. The next step was to start fitting the six roof panels. There were a few alignment issues, as the panels weren't square. The planks also extended beyond the roof panel framework, so I needed to do some trimming. 
Inside the roof, on the rear wall, I fitted two bolts to hold the roof in the closed position. This isn't all that holds it closed. There are also four clasps on the corners of the roof. These hold it down against storms, and provide an additional means to keep the roof from rolling open. On the 28th of July, the second pier adapter was fitted to pier 2. Inside the roof, on the rear roof wall, I added some diagonal braces to help prevent the roof from sagging under its own weight. When the second pier adapter fixings had cured, I mounted both telescopes to the piers. This allowed me to check on the roof clearance for both scopes while opening the roof. I was then able to check on the field of view from both scopes with the roof in the open position. The top edge of the roof is actually below the hedge line when viewed from the telescopes. This is the reason the roof was designed to drop down as it opened. At the end of July, the roof edging was fitted. On the first day of August, they were painted in bitumen. The following day, I fitted the opening front flap of the roof. It needed a bit of trimming on the bottom edge, due to the weight of the roof causing it to sag a little in the middle. Once it fitted properly, it was painted. Four additional bolts were added to lock it closed, and also lock it through the roof runners. By now, the roof had gained quite a bit of weight, so I bought a small winch to wind it closed. It would open under its own weight. On the 4th of August, I started covering the roof with felt. It was a long job, and hard on the knees, balanced on the ladder to spread my weight, as I worked along the roof. At each overlapping edge, I sealed the felt with bitumen, and it was then weighted down to set. It took much of the day to get the felt nailed, and glued on, and it wasn't until late afternoon, that I started painting it with a silver bitumen. The silver bitumen paint was a special heat reflective design, which both protects the felt, and reduces heat buildup in the observatory. The following day, I got the winch installed on the floor, against the back wall. The cable runs vertically up, then over this pulley, before attaching to an eye in the roof rear wall. This wide view shows the whole setup. Here's a short video clip of the roof operation. While there were still some jobs to do, first light came on August the 5th, capturing a daylight moon. Here's the image. I do like to see the moon against a blue sky. After a few days waiting for supplies, the postman brought some neoprene sheet. This was to fill the gap around the base of each pier. A ring was cut and test fitted over the pier. After I got the size right, I cut some plywood rings, which would be used to screw the neoprene to the floor. It was now the 16th of August, and up until then, it had been a big step up into the observatory. I wanted some removable steps, so I could cut the lawn without them being in the way. Here's the almost finished steps. Metal brackets were fitted to the top, to allow them to be hooked into the top edge of the plinth. So this is it, pretty much finished. There are still some internal works to do, such as hard-wired mains power, plus some interior red and white lighting. I may also make a small warm room next to the deep sky pier. To the left of the observatory, I built two raised bed vegetable planters. And to the right, I've got another small lawn to lay, and I'm also building a small section of railway, as a garden feature.